Hello friends. I'm so happy that we're finally able to regather this weekend. And if you were not able to join us, then I'm glad that you are here and connecting in this way. And I hope you'll be able to join us for a gathering very soon. We live in a time when we have more choices than probably anyone in history. I mean, we can see all of the choices on all of our screens and in front of us all of the time. <laughs> it's overwhelming. I mean, you go in the grocery store and you don't have to choose between six different kinds of salsa. You're choosing between 24 or 48 or more kinds of salsa. People who are dating, um, it's not like they're just looking at the, the folks in their their little circle of friends, they can go online and they can find a million potential matches. Car shoppers aren't limited to the local car lot. They can go online and find an endless array of options. People who are looking for jobs and vocations, they can go online and they can find a million options. It's the American dream. It's you could be anyone. You could do anything. You could have anything. The sky is the limit. And we all want to be happy. And you would think with so many choices available to us that we would be happy. But somehow many people are not happy. Uh, researchers have found that actually when, when you let people choose from six different kinds of salsa in the grocery store. So you say, here's your options, here's six choices, and they look, and then they pick a salsa, and then you go back and uh, the researchers say, are you happy with your choice? Uh, do you think you picked the right one? Most people are happy with their choice. They say, yeah, I, I feel pretty good about the salsa I chose. Now, uh, you, you send those folks into a grocery store with 24 different kinds of salsa and you let them choose and and then you go back and say are you happy with your choice and people aren't nearly as happy they they second guess themselves they they don't feel nearly as good about their choice they're like i i don't know if i chose the best one maybe i should have chosen that other one i, I bet that other one was better they, they don't feel as good. And so with having so many choices, it is paralyzing. We live in this, this swipe culture. It's uh, all the options and swipe, swipe. And uh, nobody is really certain about their choices. Um, so if there's a way to keep our options open, that feels better. That feels safer. It's hard to go all in on anything. And, of course, millennials, uh, they get accused of being afraid of commitment as if they are somehow different. I don't think they are. I think the, the indecision is just a product of having a million options. And in a world with a million options, it just makes sense. It's no wonder that we aren't sure what we want. And so we save our receipts. We might take that thing back. We, we keep our fingers in many pies. Our friendships are an inch deep and a mile wide. Uh, You've got 500 Facebook friends. Uh, we date for years. People have friends with benefits, but no commitment. Uh, we aren't sure if we like our jobs. We aren't sure if we're going to stick around or not. We live our life as if we're trying it out. And just preferring to explore ideas and, and explore options. And we might offer to volunteer for an hour or two if we have a spare hour or two. But don't sign us up for anything regular and committed and I'm, I'm all in, always here. We prefer situations where we can back out if we need to. And we're afraid to in, invest too deeply in anything, in, in any relationship, any organization. And so we don't throw ourselves wholeheartedly into anything. If someone gets too clingy, if someone asks too much of us, 
it it kind of makes us nervous that it doesn't ugh. what if we change our mind there, there are too many choices and and so we wring our hands and it's just overwhelming people aren't sure what they want now no matter what they have they're wondering hmm what about that that next best thing what about that that better thing maybe that was better uh, whether it's a job or a spouse or a, a vehicle or a place to live or a church or friends on and on and on now advertisers they have found that people are actually more motivated by the thought of losing what they have losing something than they are by the thought of gaining something of the exact same value we're we're more afraid to lose something of five dollars than to gain something of five dollars uh, could it be that it's because we're not really sure what we want but don't take away what I already have and so for instance like a, a salesperson who is selling uh, insulation to homeowners um, well they won't sell nearly as much insulation if they're telling people how much money they can save by insulating their home then if they turn that around into a loss figure telling them well if you don't insulate your home here's how much money you could lose by not insulating now that that fear of losing it might motivate someone to make a, a real small purchase but it fails to motivate people to really go all in to fully commit and it's because we're, we're still not sure what we want we just don't want to lose what we have and so in this world of a million choices people are searching they're scrolling and swiping and hunting and digging and scratching and, and looking and searching for this elusive feeling pleasure now I'm happy because who doesn't want to be happy so your first discussion question today uh, if you're watching this at home I'd encourage you to gather with the folks in your home and just briefly discuss can you think of times examples when you've seen too many choices result in indecision and second guessing and discontent? All right, welcome back. Researcher Pamela King, she's a professor of applied developmental science at the School of Psychology at Fuller Theological Seminary. She puts her finger on something important. Uh, her research focuses on joy. And joy is different, she says, from emotions of you know happiness or pleasure these feelings that come and go the the highs and the lows joy is different she says joy is an appraisal of what is important it's knowing what matters and the the reason that we are able to experience joy in the face of suffering is because we've made an appraisal of what's an important what's important and and now we know what matters most in life and so we can stay connected to what matters most even in the face of loss and suffering and so her research found that joy is impacted by authenticity by growing in depth of relationship with others contributing to others and living in line with our ethical and spiritual ideals and so joy frees people from scrolling and swiping and hunting and searching and digging and scratching and bargain shopping and impulse buying and second guessing and 
all of that. So another discussion question for you quickly. Who is somebody who embodies joy to you? Uh, in what way are they in touch with what matters the most? So go ahead, pause the video and have that discussion. All right, welcome back. This brings us to a set of twin parables that Jesus tells. You can find them in Matthew 13. Jesus says, first of all, that the kingdom of God is like treasure buried in a field. So just imagine this picture, uh, a peasant farmer, a day laborer who's working out in a field of a wealthy landowner and there they are they're digging and scratching and plowing and trying to make a living and all of a sudden this day laborer he hears a clunk and he feels something solid in the dirt it's hidden so he starts pulling scoops of dirt away and he cannot believe what he's found he pulls some more dirt away and here is a massive pot brimming with coins and jewelry of all kinds jackpot he he just struck it rich out of nowhere he wasn't even looking for it he just stumbled upon it and there it is a buried treasure now we hear a story like that and we're like yeah that's a fairy tale that's that's too good to be true but in Jesus day it was not uncommon to bury your wealth. Uh, it was considered a form of banking. So you're like, okay, who's who's this pot belong to? Well, uh, in ancient Palestine, this land that has been overrun by invader after invader in recent history, is there really an easy way of knowing? Uh, you know, if, if the owner of this pot died or was killed without anyone else knowing that they had it or where it was buried then then there it is and there it sits for years undiscovered now this day laborer he's looking at it he, he looks he looks around to his right to his left D did anyone else see him did they stop their work no one seems to have noticed and so he quickly pushes the dirt back over it. He covers this treasure up and, and tries to make it look just the way it was. He, he stands up and he, he's looking around, taking a bearing of where he is in the field, uh, finding some landmarks so that he can triangulate. And, okay, I, I think this is about where I'm at. He doesn't want anyone else digging it up, but he also wants to be able to come back. And so he needs to know where it is. He spends the rest of the day just trying to act calm. His insides are buzzing and, and bursting. The lifting law of the day said he cannot take that treasure from that field legally. He can't do it. But... He can buy that field. And if buried treasure is found in a field that you own, then that buried treasure belongs to you. And so that night, the day laborer, he races home and he's crunching numbers. What will it take? <clears throat> what will it take to buy this field? And he takes an appraisal of what is most important to him, what matters the most. And he changes his entire life, changes his life completely in one day. He throws an estate sale. And it isn't hard for him. It doesn't feel like sacrifice or loss because he is moved, Jesus says, by joy. And so he begins selling everything 
that he owns, his clothes, his pots and pans, his tools, his collection of wooden birds, every knickknack, every trinket, every oil lamp, the junk drawer, the blankets, the bedding, every scrap of food, everything. And finally, he sells the house, the property itself. And this peasant day laborer is left a homeless person with only the clothes on his back and a bag of money full of joy. And for the first time in his life, he's all in. He's fully committed. He's sold out. And so he makes his way to the landowner, this wealthy landowner who owns the field. He makes his way to his house. And inside he's just buzzing with joy. But he knows if I act too giddy, this landowner, he's going to get a whiff of it. And he won't sell. He'll know something is up. And so he has to stay calm. And so hope against hope. <coughs> He makes his pitch, stay calm, breathe deep, speak slowly. He makes his pitch to the landowner. I would like to buy your field. And the landowner listens. Hmm. He thinks the price is good. He mulls it over and eventually he agrees to the sale of the land. And so this exchange of ownership happens and the day laborer walks away trying to moderate his excitement <laughs> until he gets away from the, la the previous landowner's home and then he is just exuberant. The land is his. The buried treasure is his. He's filled with joy. He's made this appraisal of what matters most he sold out hope against hope. He went all in on one thing. And so Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. It's like a buried treasure. People are out in the field of life with a million options in front of them. And they are scratching and digging and swiping and scrolling and just trying to make a living, trying to be happy living in a world with a million options until clunk what's this they they stumble upon the kingdom of god they discover the kingdom of god and and people who have never been all in on one thing they have been trying to keep their options open afraid to invest deeply they find the kingdom of god and they say, this, this is of ultimate importance. This matters the most. And so the people of the kingdom of God, they are the community of the all in. They are the community of the sold out, the fully committed, because they've made this appraisal of what's most important. And they've decided what matters the most. Now, Jesus tells this story and he pairs it with one other parable uh, because they, they work together. So, parable number two. Jesus says, The kingdom of God is like a merchant looking for beautiful pearls. Now, that must have caught the disciples' attention. Modern Christians, they often compare the kingdom of God to a beautiful pearl. Uh, but but that's not what Jesus said. If, if you do that, you're trying to read something into what Jesus says. Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a merchant. Now, merchants, they didn't have good reputations. They sold things at prices that people couldn't really afford. They were shady. And this merchant, he's seeking beautiful pearls. Now, you could say, well, that's good. You know, things of beauty that are formed out of suffering and irritation and uh, self-protection. On the one hand, yeah, pearls were 
the finest. They were the most valuable jewelry anyone could own. And so there are records of pearls that people had uh, back in the day that were valued at the equivalent of like millions of dollars. But on the other hand, pearls were not kosher. They came from shellfish. And so if you're reading Leviticus or if you're reading Deuteronomy, uh, they say shellfish are unclean, detestable. And so, in fact, if you're reading the entire Bible, it's kind of ironic. There's not any other place in Scripture that has anything positive to say about pearls. Only, only negative. And so, the, in this story, uh, I'm sure that Jesus is telling the disciples, are, they're like, huh. So, the kingdom of God is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. And one day, this merchant came upon a pearl of exceptional beauty and value. And, and this merchant is just smitten. And so he goes home and he makes an appraisal of what's most important. And he also has an estate sale so he sells his clothes and his pots and pans and his tools and knickknacks and trinkets and every piece of jewelry and every collectible that he had wanted to sell. Every oil lamp, the junk drawer, the blankets, the bedding, every scrap of food, everything finally until he sells the house and the property. And there he stands, a homeless person with only the clothes on his back. And a bag full of money. Now if, if the merchant goes through with this. He can't go on being a merchant. If he really wants to keep that pearl. He, he won't have any product. He won't have any money to work with. The only thing he will have. Will be that, that beautiful pearl. That he's smitten with. And so he's giving up everything. You could say he's even giving up his, his career. His vocation. His identity. Uh, not that those should be the same thing, but he, you know, he's giving up a lot here, going all in on one thing. But the merchant had found what mattered the most. He had found this thing that he said, that's, that's my ultimate concern, and I'm all in. I'm fully committed. I'm sold out. And so he trades every single thing that he ever worked for in order to walk away with a, a little pearl, a thing of beauty formed out of suffering and irritation, self-protection. And Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. It's like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls. Now, these two parables side by side. In the first story, the kingdom of God is like something that someone just happens upon uh, and it complete they completely change their life but they just happen upon it they're trying to be happy they're trying to scrap together a life and they're really unsure of what's most important and what matters the most and then clunk they find the kingdom of God the rule and reign of God the, the community of the kingdom of God and they're like ah, jackpot they feel like they struck it rich. And so they find this deep delight in realizing what matters most and joy in going all in, investing deeply in relationships and no longer holding back. They don't have their fingers in many pies and keeping their options open because they're all in and they're growing in authenticity. And rather than having a million shallow friendships that mean nothing, they're investing deeply in relationships that are messy and require work and time and intention and they start to live what they believe so they're all in they're fully committed they found the kingdom of god now the second parable says the kingdom of god isn't like finding something it's like a person it's like a person a merchant who knows exactly what they're seeking, uh, something of incomparable beauty. 
and value. And when they find it, they sell out. They go all in. What if Jesus is comparing himself? What if he sees himself as that merchant? What if Jesus sees himself as that shifty character with a bad reputation who's seeking something that most folks would say, you want something unkosher. You want something detestable. You want something unclean. But Jesus sees that same thing as having immeasurable beauty, immeasurable value. What if you are like the pearl in Jesus' parable? What if Jesus looks at your life of suffering and irritation and self-protection and Jesus is smitten? He says, I'll give everything. And what if your life is beautiful to Jesus in a way that makes Jesus giddy with joy? You are of ultimate importance to me. He says, I'm all in. I'll give everything, no matter what. I have to give up. I'm all in. Now, what if Jesus isn't asking just for a level of commitment from us that feels like guilt? Uh, that feels like, hey, can you give up a few hours of your time, uh, but ultimately ends up feeling like a net loss? What if that's not what Jesus is really after? You know, a lot of people, if you ask them about their their church experience, their religious experience, uh, it kind of feels to them like a relationship of guilt. And yeah, you're supposed to volunteer this many hours, and it in the end it kind of feels like a net loss. Uh, and they may have even heard this particular parable in that way. Uh, People feel like the church tries to milk them of so many dollars and pressures them to volunteer so many spare hours of their time in the midst of a life of a million other obligations and demands. But that's missing what Jesus is actually saying. See, in Jesus' parable, what causes someone to make any change? It's joy. Joy is the agent of change. It isn't guilt. It's not obligation. So what if Jesus is trying to show his disciples this path to joy, which is when you do find what matters the most and what is of ultimate concern, go all in. Don't fracture your life up into a million little pieces don't keep digging in the field and scrolling and swiping and hunting and scratching and dirt, digging and searching, keeping your options open. No, enjoy, sell everything for the kingdom of God. It, it brings this final question. What if Neetart's Friends Church was the community of the all in? What would it look like? What would it feel like? Uh, what if we were the community of the, the sold out, the, the fully committed? What would it mean for you? What would it mean for me? You say, I, I don't even know how to think about that while COVID's doing what COVID's doing. And yeah, COVID's been crazy. And yeah, COVID has messed up a lot of things for a lot of people, not just here, but around the planet. And yet... The, the incredible thing about joy is that you can stay connected to joy, uh, those things that matter the most, even in the midst of struggle, even in the midst of adversity, in the midst of loss. That's why joy is joy. You can stay connected to what matters most. And so what if Jesus longs for us to have this experience? He says, I, I know what it's like to be all in. And what if Jesus longs to give us that experience? All in. Uh, giving everything. Worth it every time. That kind of love. Because what if Jesus knows, ultimately, there's no other way of life worth living? 
Love you, friends.